Do you want to study God's Word in greater depth, but you can't leave town or your job to attend seminary? Faith Theological Seminary of Catonsville is a Bible-believing, evangelical, non-denominational seminary with professors that have earned PhDs in their fields of instruction. We have a beautiful campus on North Rolling Road, just west of the city of Baltimore. We offer biblical studies degrees at the associates and bachelor's levels, along with a Master of Divinity in Chaplaincy and a Doctor of Ministry in Expository Preaching. Our tuition is affordable, and some scholarships are available. We operate under an exemption from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, granting us authority to offer advanced educational instruction and degrees in religious studies. Visit our website at ftscatonsville.org or call our offices at 410-788-6132. We look forward to seeing you study God's Word with us. Take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. you take God's Word this morning, open to the book of Colossians chapter 1, the book of Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be looking this morning at verse 15 down to verse 20. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word today, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you for your inspired word. This is your authority. We have no other message than the message you give us in Scripture. So, Lord, would you please... Uh, Give us understanding into the Word of God today and speak to our hearts and use it, Lord, for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to be starting a series from now up until Christmas, a short series. I know we've been in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we'll pick up that after Christmas. But I want to do a series that I'm calling God in a Manger, and I want to focus on passages in the New Testament that deal with the incarnation of Christ. And this is certainly one of those passages that speaks about who Jesus is. And I think it's good that we look at this this morning. I I read one time in the newspaper of a wealthy Boston couple that was having a christening party for their newborn baby, and they invited all their friends and their family. And a half hour into the party, when it was time to bring the baby out for everyone, they made a, a horrifying discovery that they, the mother had left the baby on the bed in the, in, the, in the master bedroom, and people were putting their coats there on that bed, and they found the baby uh, suffocated there beneath a mound of discarded wraps. Just a terrible story. But when I read that story, I thought about how that is a perfect analogy of Christmas time. People are so wrapped up in the festivities, the gifts, the last-minute shopping, the decorations, all the things that come with Christmas that they actually forget about the main reason, the purpose of Christmas. The, the baby that was born in the manger was God. God became a man. Christmas is all about Christ. Now, nowhere is this clear than in the book of Colossians, because Colossians is a book that emphasizes the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And the key verse was verse number 18. Look at verse 18 of chapter 1. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have 
the preeminence. Look at the word preeminence there, a very interesting word. It's the word protuo, and it means to be in first or above all others, to be in first place. This is the only time that this word is actually used in the New Testament. It is used in the Septuagint to talk about Haman in the book of Esther, who was honored above all others around him. It is used in an apocryphal book of 2 Maccabees to speak about uh, a man of high position. A few times in the New Testament, this, this word is combined with another Greek word to form a compound word, and we kind of get an understanding of what it means by looking at that. For example, it's used in 3 John regarding a man by the name of Diotrephes. If you read that epistle, you know that Diotrephes was seeking to be above everyone else. He loved to have the preeminence above all the others in the church. And the Greek word that is used there is phileo, love, protuo, first place. He loved being in first place. Now, that's a term that is okay if you're talking about football, you know, or the Ravens. I love for them to be in first place. But when you're talking about in the church, here is a man who is exalting himself above everyone else, in the church, and that was the word that is used there. It's also used to speak about the Pharisees who love to sit in the, um, uh, the, the chief seats, or we could say the place of authority, and the word that is used there is protuo, cathedra, the first seats, the chief seats, the chiefs that give, uh, the seats, I should say, that give first in rank. And so by looking at that, we kind of get an idea of the word as it is used here in Colossians. It's the idea that Jesus is supreme. He is preeminent. He is the one that is first above all others, the preeminent one. And that is the theme of the book of Colossians, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. You can outline the book like this in chapter 1, Christ's preeminence is declared. In chapter 2, Christ's preeminence is defended. In chapters 3 and 4, Christ's preeminence is demonstrated. But what I want you to see is this passage that we just read here where it talks about Jesus Christ and his preeminence, and there are three reasons why we should put Christ first. Beloved, Jesus Christ should be first in every part of our life. He should be preeminent in every area of our life, and this is especially true around Christmas time when we are celebrating Christ. We're celebrating the fact that he was the one who came to be the Savior for our sins, God in the flesh. And he is to be preeminent in our celebration of Christmas. So let me give you three reasons for this. First of all, number one, why is Christ preeminent? Because all of God's person is contained in him. Look at verse number 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, Paul jumps into deep theology here when he talks about Christ, and, uh, and these words here are very weighty. When he talks about he is the image of the invisible God, there are many false teachers that point to verse 15, and they like to say that Jesus was a created being, and therefore he was not God when it says that he was the firstborn of every creature. There are some people that say, well, that implies that he was a created being if he's the firstborn among creatures. If you ever talk to a Jehovah Witness, they like to spend a lot of time on verse 15 trying to say that Christ was created. Well, that's heresy, and it's a heresy that is not new. In fact, this was a heresy that Paul was dealing with when he wrote this letter to the book of, uh, or this book of Colossians, this letter to the church at Colossae and to the other churches that were in that region. What was the heresy that he was dealing with? And really to understand these verses, we got to get a little bit of a background into the heresy that was spreading around into that region in the first century. It was an a, a initial form of what we now call Gnosticism. How do we know what Gnosticism believes? Because in 1945, there was a farmer by the name of Muhammad Ali, not, this, not the boxer. He was digging for soil. He was trying to fertilize his crops. He was trying to get good soil for his crops. And he happened to dig up a, a big uh, earthen jar, earthware jar, near a city uh, in Egypt called Nag Hammadi. And uh, inside that jar, he found uh, manuscripts that presented a Christ 
that is far different from the Christ that we read about in the New Testament, and we now know those as the Nag Hammadi Library, and they were Gnostic writings. That was the writing of the Gnostics, what they believed. All this heresy was written down, so we now have a little bit of an understanding of the heresy that Paul was dealing with when he wrote this book of Colossians. And so let me just give you a summary of what they believed. What did they believe about God? Well, one profound idea, or I should say an idea that has profound implications, not necessarily a profound idea, but the implications of it are, is profound, and that is this, that they believe that God was a spirit, all spirit was good, all matter or material things were evil. And so that idea had consequences. If God is good, he would not create matter or material things or a physical world because that's evil. And so the highest God was not the God who created the universe. Gnostics believe that God, the highest God, the supreme God, what he did was he put forth a series of emanations from himself. What do I mean by emanations? Beings that came out of him that were a little less God than him, a little less deity. They were, they're called by some scholars, the demiurge or, uh, or, or, or sub-gods. And so here's the supreme God, and out of him came a lesser God, and out of him came a lesser God, and out of him a lesser God. And, and so you have this whole chain of beings that lead up to the supreme God. It's bizarre, isn't it? And finally, you get to a, a, a certain being in this chain of beings that is far enough removed from the supreme God that he could actually create the heavens and the earth. Uh, he could create material things, a physical world. And so this is the God of creation, they would say. They also say that's the God of the Old Testament. And they viewed that God as not a God that was good, but a God that was actually blocking all others from ascending this ladder to the supreme God. And so, therefore... Uh, the, the, the job of anyone who wanted to ascend up the ladder into spiritual perfection was to get around this God, this God of the Old Testament, they would say. Uh, this God who created the world, and he did a botched job of creation. He put together spirit and uh, material things. He put together spirit, the, the visible with the invisible, the spiritual with the physical. To do a, to an analogy would be, it would be like a jeweler who, would, who did a bad job putting together pure gold with junk metal when he made a piece of jewelry. That's what this God did, and that's what the Gnostics believed. And so, therefore, it was the duty of anyone who wanted to ascend up into spiritual perfection to ascend this ladder of beings. And by the way, if you wanted to ascend up into spiritual perfection, you had to you had to have special knowledge. That's where we get the whole idea of Gnosticism. It's from the Greek word knowledge. You had to have knowledge. You had to have the password. You ever, when you're a kid, have a club with a clubhouse? Not everyone could be a part of your club. You had to know the password. You know, you knock on the clubhouse door. What's the password? You can't be a part of our club unless you know the password. That's in essence what the Gnostics were like back in that day. You couldn't be a part of them unless you had this special secret knowledge that only they could give you salvation came through knowledge. It came through wisdom. And you had to have this wisdom. You had to have this knowledge in order for salvation to take place for you. And so that's what they taught. What did they teach about Jesus? Well, they taught that Jesus was simply one of these lesser gods that emanated from the supreme God. He was one in the chain. And he could give some knowledge. He could give some wisdom. But you needed more than just that. You needed more than just Christ. He was only one of many. And by the way, this heresy also attacked, uh, excuse me, attacked the incarnation of Christ because they taught that he really didn't become a man. He only appeared as a man. That's why he could walk on water. That's why, you know, he, they would say he would leave no footprints when he would walk because he wasn't really a physical Man, he didn't really have a physical body. He only appeared that way because if he's really a God, that he wouldn't take on human flesh. And so that whole uh, heresy attacked this whole idea of God becoming a man. Why would God want to become a man? Why would that ever want to do that if all flesh 
is evil. And so this one named Christ could give you some knowledge, but you needed a whole lot more than just him. And so you can imagine how this heresy was attacking Christianity. It was attacking the whole idea of Christ becoming a man and who he was. Now, it was against this kind of thinking that the Apostle Paul picks up his pen and he writes about the person of Jesus Christ. And when you read these verses here in the Colossians chapter 1, what you see are weighty words. I mean, honestly, I'm trying to preach on five verses. That's, that's a fool's errand because there's so much in these verses. There's no way you can get through all of it, of what Paul means when he's talking about Christ. He jumps off into deep theological waters in verse number 15 when he says, Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. That word image there is the Greek word icon. You ever hear the word, the word icon? That's exactly where we get the word from, from this Greek word. It's really a Greek word, and it means an exact likeness. In fact, in, in, in antiquity, when a sculpture was so skilled that he could make a sculpture, a, a bust of a man, and it was exactly what that man looked like, that was called an icon. One time, there's a letter that was found of an, an ancient letter of a soldier who wrote to his father, and he sends a picture that an artist had drawn of this soldier. He sends it to his father, and in the letter he says, Father, I send you this icon of me that you might remember me. And, and really what it meant was a photograph. Of course, it wasn't a photograph because they didn't have cameras back then. But I think it would be the nearest word that we could use today to talk about this word here would be a photograph. So if you allow me a little liberty, who is Jesus? He is a photograph of the invisible God. He is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. That's what he's saying right here. And the word means more than just representation. It actually means a manifestation. It has a deeper understanding with that. Jesus is the manifestation of God the Father. That's who he is. Greek scholars are very clear on this, that the word here actually means more than just revelation. It is a manifestation of God. Jesus is not just a lesser emanation of the true God. He is the visible manifestation of the supreme God. That's who Jesus is. In Christ, the invisible God became visible. That's what he's talking about. He is the image of the invisible God. In John 1.18, the Bible says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him, and I love the word there, it's exegetomai, he has revealed him, he has made him clear. You want to know what God the Father is like? Just look at Jesus in Scripture. That's what he is. That's what he does. He reveals him. But then also he says this in verse 15, look what he says, he's the firstborn of every creature. Again, this is a very weighty word, firstborn, prototokos. Again, it doesn't mean that Jesus is a part of creation, it doesn't mean that he was a created being. The word firstborn here is not a word of time or origin or chronology. That's not what firstborn means here. Normally, when we use the word firstborn, it has the idea of time. You know, you have four children. This is my firstborn. That means he was born before the other three. But that's not how it's used here. The term firstborn is not with reference to time or chronology. It is with reference to uh, rank. He's above all. He's head of all. You know, sometimes in the Old Testament, a firstborn child would not get the rank of firstborn. You might be born first in a family, but that doesn't guarantee that that's going to be your rank. For example, did you know in the book of uh, Genesis, we read of Esau and Jacob. Which one was born first? Esau. Who got the rank of firstborn son? It wasn't Esau, even though he was born first. It was Jacob that got the rank of firstborn. Look in verse 18, it uses this term again, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the, the what? The firstborn from the dead. Again, that's not talking about timing or chronology. 
Because let me ask you a question. Was Jesus the first person to ever come out of the grave, to ever resurrect? We would have to say no, because we know in the Old Testament that there were prophets who uh, were, did the miracle of resurrection. We know Elijah did that. He raised a dead son. We know that Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. We know that Jesus resurrected Lazarus. We know that at the crucifixion of Christ, there were Old Testament saints that came out of the grave. Jesus was not the first person to ever be resurrected. However, he is the firstborn of, from the dead. And what does that mean? That means of all those who have ever been resurrected or ever will be resurrected, he ranks number one. It's not a term of chronology. It is a term of rank. And so where is Jesus in all this? Paul said, look, he is number one. He is supreme. He is higher than the highest. He is preeminent. He is God in the flesh. All of God's person is contained in Jesus Christ. But here's the second point. All of God's power is centered in him. Look in verse number 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. You want to know who Jesus is? He is the creator who made all things. That little babe in the manger was the creator of the world. He made all things. And notice the th three phrases here where it presents Christ as preeminent over all of creation. It says, by him all things were created. And notice that he created visible and, in in and invisible in both of those realms. He didn't just create the visible, physical things. He created the invisible. Talking about the spiritual world. And in verse uh, 16, he talks about thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. What is that? That is a, a classification of angelic powers, four different classes. That means he created all the angels, all those in the spiritual realm. He created everything in the physical realm. In John 1, 3, it says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Think about that, beloved. When you think about that, think about the sheer size of the universe, which is staggering. It's staggering. Listen to this. The, su the sun has a diameter of 864,000 miles and could hold 1.3 million planets the size of Earth inside of it. That's how big the sun is. But if you think that's big, there's a star that they found has a diameter of 100 million miles, which is larger than the Earth's orbit around the sun. And you know what astronomers have found out? We live in a universe that has billions of stars like that. And you know what? Jesus made all of it. He created all of it. That's just staggering to think about. And notice it says that in verse 16, all things were created by him, through him, we could say, is the Greek preposition there, die through him and for him. And I think, again, Paul is taking aim at another Greek philosophy. Greek philosophers taught that, that everything that was created, you needed a primary cause, you needed an instrumental cause, you needed a final cause. Everything needed those three causes according to these Greek thinkers. The primary cause is a plan. If I'm going to create something, I'm not a very creative person. But if I were going to, say, create maybe a sculpture myself, I would need, first of all, a primary cause. What is that? I would need a plan. What am I going to what am I going to make here? And then I would need the instrumental cause. I would need the power or the skill to do it, which I don't have. But let's just say I did have. I, I, I want to make this sculpture. I, I have to have a plan in my mind. I have to have the power to do it. And then I have to have a final cause. What's the final cause? The final cause is a purpose. I have to have a reason why I want to do it. Why do I want to uh, make a sculpture of something? Well, maybe I, my purpose is, is I want to put it in my backyard. I want it to be beautiful. And by the way, anything that I would make, you wouldn't want to put it anywhere. I promise you that. But I would have to have those three causes. And that's what Greeks typically thought. Here we apply this to Jesus. Paul applies this to Jesus. Paul is saying when it comes to creation, 
Jesus is the primary cause because he planned it all. He is the instrumental cause because it was through his power that it was all created. And he is the final cause. Why did he do it? What was the purpose? He did it for his own pleasure. Jesus is the primary cause. He is the instrumental cause. He is the final cause. All things were created by him. Notice what it says in verse 17. Before him, all things did not exist. You know, Jehovah Witnesses in their New World Translation, when they take this verse, they insert a word into it. I don't know if you ever knew this, but they insert the word other. He is before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. That word other, they insert in there. It's not in any Greek text. You pick up a Bible from the Jehovah Witnesses, the New World Translation, you'll see that word other there, but it's not in any of the Greek manuscripts. You know why they slip it in there? Because it changes the whole meaning of the verse. It makes Jesus uh, a created being, just an agent of creation instead of the creator himself. And that's a dishonest, blasphemous way to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. By him all things were created. Before him, all things did not exist. And notice the next part of verse 17. And in him, all things consist, or we could say, hold together. Not only did Jesus create the universe, he sustains it all. He sustains it. Now, science was not my best subject in school. So bear with me here. And you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. But nuclear scientists tell us that all the substance in the universe is constructed. We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life, and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever-living story. Do you want to study God's Word in greater depth, but you can't leave town or your job to attend seminary? Faith Theological Seminary of Catonsville is a Bible-believing, evangelical, non-denominational seminary with professors that have earned PhDs in their fields of instruction. We have a beautiful campus on North Rolling Road, just west of the city of Baltimore. We offer Biblical Studies degrees at the Associates and Bachelor's levels, along with a Master of Divinity in Chaplaincy and a Doctor of Ministry in Expository Preaching. Our tuition is affordable, and some scholarships are available. We operate under an exemption from the Maryland Higher Education Commission, granting us authority to offer advanced educational instruction and degrees in religious studies. Visit our website at ftscatonsville.org or call our offices at 410-788-6132. We look forward to seeing you study God's Word with us.